Awesome. Well, thanks, everyone. Uh, welcome to the seventh episode of the Kyokushin Shuffle. Uh, I have a very special guest here. Um, thank you for everyone that was listening to the last one with Shian Lance, but this one is a beauty. Uh, from Tamworth, New South Wales, please welcome Shian Mark Tyson from uh, New South Wales. Shian, how are you? Good, thanks, Sensei. Uh, thank you for inviting me to be a part of your show. It's uh, good to see that you're running the Kyokushin media along the lines like you are, and it's uh, no doubt it's a bonus for all of us Kyokushin if I can. Oh, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Um, you've a, uh, a special person, I'd like to put it that way. Uh, I don't know you as officially and formally and personally as I have uh, with many that are here in Victoria, but uh, we've crossed paths a couple of times. You're very close friends and good good friends with my Shian, with Shian Billy. But, um, you know, uh, Shian Mark, this is, a, this is a fun chat. This is something that I've uh, being passionate about in, in, in getting as many senseis and shians and, 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 and a multiple of martial artists um, that, are, that are based in Australia and, and around the world. But to be, to be straight through, straight up on this, please share with us, um, I guess, your background, where you were born and, and, and simple things like that that can just give us some perspective and then how you got your hands dirty in, in two martial arts. We were in Sydney and I saw a big karate sign up there and I went and joined them and and trained for them for a few months. Yeah. Um, did a great And being ignorant to the martial arts, again, I had, I had nothing to compare this martial arts to. So I thought that this was, this was the, you know, the all said and done with, come to, with regards to karate styles. Nice. So I trained for, for a few months there. And then I, one Sunday morning, I had my uncle Gus come around my house and ask me if, he wanted, if I wanted to go to him. Uh, I had my uncle Gus ask me if I wanted to go with him to keep him company for the Australian national championships being held at the Sydney Town Hall. Okay. Uh, where she and Jim Phillips um, oh, yes. was actually all competing because Henshi, John Taylor and, and she and Phillips were on the dojo at that time, particular time together. Um, uh, I was very, very fortunate to turn up that day and, um, and uh, sort of watch the fighters and uh, get the opportunity sort of to see Masoyama, who I didn't actually know who he was at the time. Yeah. I could tell that when he entered the arena and he entered the room, he was a well-respected person. Um, it wasn't, you know, until I was to learn later how important he was to the martial arts world. <laughs> in general. Um, uh, getting back to what I said with regards to wasn't sure what was missing. It wasn't until actually I saw the followers come out in Kyokushin and compete in the knockdown style that we do. And I actually got to see what full contact techniques under pressure actually can do and how, yes. how powerful and how graceful they are. So actually uh, the very next day I joined up uh, to the Wunlai Junction Dojo. And I was very, very fortunate because, you know, Monday, Wednesdays and Fridays, I trained with Hanshi John Taylor. He was a stickler on his kihon, on his kata, on his eye to on his mm. and so forth. And because uh, she and Jim Phillips at the time was a sensei, he was a nidai, um, his focus was on conditioning. So on a Tuesday, Thursdays and Saturdays, it was push-ups, sit-ups, squats, bag work, sparring, late sessions, etc., and running on stomachs and many, many, many of the things that we don't do today. And, and I'm sure that, you know, if, if a lot of my students today could see some of the stuff that we did back in the day in Us. terms of old school, training, they'd be absolutely shocked. You know, so sometimes I, I tell them bits and pieces about some of the things that we do, and you see the look on their face, I'm like, I don't think they believe me. So it's just another world that we grew up in. So we were very, very fortunate. Yeah, well, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, uh, I, I've said it to others, we, we could do the introduction of, of, of um, the start of karate and that could just take an hour on itself. So thank you for keeping that to a, to a minimum there because I'm sure you could go into fun with these are. But Xi'an, um, you obviously then were uh, fully invested and, and, and from someone, um, can, and I mean it respectfully, where were, you born, where were, were you born in Australia? Or were you born, uh, where were you born and where were you raised? I was born in New Zealand. Yes. Uh, I was born in Wellington. Um, I was raised in Wanganui till I was seven. And then I came across Australia um, to Sydney. Um, I've been an Australian resident, full time resident ever since, permanent resident ever since. Um, you know, it's, it's, I, I think green and gold, Patrick, but unless the All Blacks play, <laughs> black and white. Oh, jeez. We have a real sporting connection to, to NZ. Um, uh, what was the question? No, no, so you were born and raised in NZ, but then you, you oh, yeah. found your way to the promised land, to the to, to where the good stuff is, and uh, and, uh, and and you've stayed here ever since. It's it went to South Sydney Boys High uh, at my high school, like Botany Public School is my primary school, and 
South Sydney Boys High was my high school, and I've never been a South Sydney Boys High supporter. I'm actually Roosters East supporters oh, then. I have geez. been sort of days up. So um, yeah, so I, I was really really lucky that you know I got the chance to be in, in a location where where Bondi Junction at the time wasn't that very far away. So I had the chance to be able to go down there every night in my training. And um, I'm very fortunate for that because, you know, it's like just getting to training can sometimes be a major task in itself. So, so no, I've been here since I was seven years old. Good one. Fantastic. Uh, we, we're going to get stuck into this here and let's get into the cool stuff. And the cool stuff was you became a sensational student for Hunty Taylor uh, and Shian Taylor at the time and, and, um, and since uh, Jimmy Phillips and, and, Again, I'll jump straight into it. You were uh, a, a fantastic full contact fighter. Can you share with us a bit of that journey and then in, in leading into how you were then also selected for the fifth world tournament? Um, thank you for your kind words, Patrick, in the, no. the beginning there. I appreciate that. Um, I started training in September of 1983 mm -hmm. and I had the my first opportunity to compete for the Bondi Junction Dojo and to compete under Kilkshin rules was February of the next year. So you look at about four months away. And when I joined up, obviously they pushed their fighters hard at Bondi Junction Dojo. And when I turned up, I put my name down with regards to competing in four months, four months time. So I trained through that four months, went down to Wollongong and competed and I actually came third. Um, I was really, really pleased with my efforts, but it was one of those moments and one of those those times when I was at the right age, I was in the right place and had the right people around me and and um, the full contact karate I could see was a was a, a major extension of the karate training with regards to um, seeing if things worked under pressure. As mm -hmm. we'll see, you know, lots of different styles, a lot lots of different, you know, um, you know ways that sort of people train with regards to full contact. Mm -hmm. um, no, but I, I wanted to sort of test myself and I, I obviously scared the crap out of me like it does for everybody else. Yes. Um, little, 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 little did I know, you know, I'd, I'd have tens and tens and tens of fights after that fight and still when I walked on the floor, I was as nervous as the, as mm. the, as the newbie that was walking on the floor. And I'm sure most fighters would appreciate and understand that fact that that doesn't change whether it's your first fight or your hundredth fight, you still feel scared and nervous and, 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 and quite a yeah. high Right, and the anxiety, etc. Um, so, so yeah, I it, it it burned a spark within me, and it was one of those things. There, when I came back from the tournament, I was absolutely ecstatic because I was able to prepare for something that was really, really difficult and demanding. But by the same token, I didn't really realize the full contact um, world. You know, just going in one tournament, it's, it doesn't. You don't get a lot of worldly experience from that with regards to internally growing. So yes. I was certainly bitten by the spark of full contact. And little did I know that would be my first contact, a first full contact fight. And geez, close to 20 years later, I've had just on 146 full contact fights in the, my career because I had the chance to open the dojo when I moved to Tamworth in 1988 with my wife. Because um, we just felt that uh, country area where she came from, which was the Tamworth area, in the okay, region, um, would be a good place to raise children. So we went up there and we opened a dojo up virtually straight away, and we were sort of in competition with a lot of other styles that were in Tamworth at the time. Oh. And we're talking 1988, so we're talking yeah, wild west days, you know, <laughs> really, really, really sort of days. The sort of days where you go to a nightclub and then you know there's going to be a fight between the bikies and the cowboys. Those sort of days. Right. So I went to Tamworth and opened up at the dojo and, and um, within the, a couple of weeks of, of being there, I got the chance to um, do some security at the local nightclub. And at this nightclub, it was probably the biggest club in, in the whole region of the New England area. So you get people coming from all different towns all around the areas that come from miles away to be able to go to the nightclub. And, and probably on a Friday and Saturday night, you probably get about a thousand people. And that's oh, wow. really good for a place like Tamworth, you know. So, yeah. So I just put there and... <laughs> it was really interesting because I got to meet who the other bouncers and security guys were. Yes. And and eighty percent of them were actually the the other martial arts instructors ah, in the you know, and two different Taekwondo styles, Shotokan, um, and a couple other ones I just can't can't remember at the time. Nice. There's about six, six or seven. And um I worked doing security there for a couple of weeks. And then one of the um 
one of the other guys come up when I was about to leave work one Sunday, one, one Monday, Sunday morning. He said, listen, uh, Mark, every, every uh, Sunday, all these bouncers and different few football players and a few martial artists from town, we get together at the police police club and we put the gloves on and do some rounds and do some martial arts awesome. training. So if you're interested in coming along, and he, he's telling me on, on the Saturday, so I knew the very, very next morning, um, this is the event he was talking about. So I, I recognized and understood when I first established my Chukshin Dojo um, um, that on some level, uh, you are in competition with the other different martial arts. Nice. And then on another level, you've got to be able to prove yourself with regards to your standards. So you mm -hmm. sort of get that respect. But again, we're talking country, country, rural area, not as much sophistication as you could imagine Understood. in Sydney. Understood. So then I went home, but I understood when he was saying that, I totally understood what, what he was saying in code. Code was, we want to test out this new Kyuk Shin guy. And see what he's like. <laughs> I really, I recognize that. So I said, yeah, no I'll come down tomorrow. I'll see you guys there. So two o'clock the next afternoon, I, I pull up outside the police police car. It's all these cars dozen cars at the front and you knew where the police police club was located that each of those cars belonged to one of the other guys that come in to do some sparring oh. um so i wandered in and i introduced myself and the other guys introduced me to the other guys around there and, and probably the average weight in that room would probably would have been about 85 kilos maybe because a lot of the guys were footballers security country guys they're not the most leanest right. sort of athletes that you see but, but strong and bulky um so he says, okay, so we're all standing there and a couple of them says, oh, we'll go first. So a couple of them stood there and sort of started their sparring and they were sort of whacking each other around and moving around the floor and whatnot there. And I'm sitting there looking at the clock thinking, if we, if we do this all in the afternoon, we're going to be in for hours now. It's tough. <laughs> like, is this the way you guys all do your sparring all the time? And they said, uh, I said, yeah, most of the time, so what do you suggest? I said, well, if we do it like we do in the dojo, you just line up with two lines and then you spar, when you finish, you shake hands and then you step to the right and then you rotate and you've got a new opponent instantly. And so, sort of, they're like, oh, and I was surprised that they were surprised. Mm. They were so anyway, um, it was a, we're going to test this young, lightweight looking guy out who's got this Yoku Shin style, which they basically knew nothing about. Um, so we were there for probably about an hour and a half when we were sparring and I sparred, I sparred each of those guys a couple of times each, but I had a lot in my favor at that time when I was pushed because these guys right from the get go were just hard, raw country guys right. sort of thing, you know, smash and bash. But then I had a few things on my favor. First thing was I was, I was young and I just moved up to Tamworth. I was 23. Nice. The second thing was I just finished training five to six nights a week for five years. Without, without hardly ever missing a night. I was that fanatical about my training. So I'd basically been training, you know, the same amount of time that a pro fighter would be yeah. training. But I'd be doing it all the time. And, and another thing on my, on my list was I had rock hard shins. You know, I was conditioned. <laughs> so long story short, mate, I, I, I hacked through these guys and hacked through these guys. And, and, and you would appreciate it, it, the, the low kick or the hisagiri is one of those things where you can crack into people and, and you can really open their eyes up with regards to yes. what you're capable of doing, as opposed to catching somebody with a, with a wild left hook punch to the face, et cetera, et cetera. So okay. I was, was really lucky in that sense um, that all of the other guys in the room had never seen, I don't think anyone move like that before. Had never seen how good, you know, good Shigeri punches to the rib cage, sure, wash you, you know, they'd never sort of seen that style of fighting before because their their styles, from what I noted, were either just football players who had never done a train day of training in their life to other martial arts instructors who had their own style, right? Of but when you compared to what I was doing, what I was doing was so many levels above. That when we finished training that day, one of the instructors come up and says, Oh, it's Mark, he says, we really enjoyed you coming along. Any chance of you coming along each Sunday and showing <laughs> the stuff that you do? And, and I did. And it wasn't long before I did that that I became the instructor every Sunday, taking the guy through different drills and well different exercises, conditioning, sort of thing. And that went on, that went on for, for, for quite a few years. And it, when I was doing that, also with the other instructors, I, I made sure that I endeared myself to them. 
in yeah. terms of establishing a good relationship, showing respect, never talking down about other styles. Of course. Cetera, because I was, I was young and I was curious about what they did and yes. what I could possibly learn off them. So it didn't take long before that they could sort of see that I wasn't, uh, how I was acting is actually absolutely how I was. And I was curious in their friendship and I was curious in possibly seeing some of their training some night if they let me come along and invite me to their dojo. Which coincidentally, over time, they all did invite me to their dojo and ask me if they could show right. their students some of the sort of stuff that they don't, don't do. Even like, even we're talking back in the, in the early 80s where, mm -hmm. where some martial arts, even karate styles, had never seen a low kick. I mean, I'm, I'm using that as an example, but that yeah. just sort of shows you how, how far behind the times all those other instructors were. And no doubt, they still contributed well to their style and, and gave their students an opportunity to train and, of course. and create a relationship and bond with all the other students and all the other wonderful benefits that come from karate training. But because these guys were also security guys, they could tell if they wanted to you know, make sure they had the, the correct correct weapons in their pouch so to speak, you know, that, that, that it would be a good thing very to come good on the show. so it didn't take long mate. over the years I, I really established myself as a martial arts instructor who who any of the other instructors and students could come into my dojo and all of the other instructors invited me to their dojos over the years so and when we're doing all this sort of stuff there we've got our own television companies and, and newspapers in Tamworth as well so it was the very, very first time that a full contact fighter had actually come to Tamworth in terms of okay. this is full contact. A lot of the other styles were, you know, as you know, they promoted as full contact, but once you sort of start breaking down the cognitive format, it's like, it's not mm. what we class as full contact, you know? So we were on television quite frequently and we were getting, you know, lots of back pages in the newspaper. And it didn't take long before we became, we became the most well-known dojo in all of Tamworth. So, and to this very day, we've still held on to that reputation. Oh, well uh, done. And I think it's just because we, we haven't changed our way with regards to old school traditions. Yes. Rituals in the dojo, respect and etiquette. The etiquette, the yep. the time, And kept yeah. the old school mentality ticking along. Because I think that once you start to delve into diluting that pool of what we hold so sacred, so precious, you give yourself a, a, a mirror copy version of what you actually could have had. Nice. And I'm very lucky too, to, to be able to have trained under Hanshi Taylor and, 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 and she and Jim Phillips because they were such hard taskmasters, just like yourself, just like your, your own teachers, you know, they, nice. it's funny, isn't it? Because it's, isn't it strange that when you're related to somebody, they tend to treat you harsher than they treat <laughs> other people. Some of the training sessions with since she and Jim Phillips were just when I look, I think back now about some of the sessions that we had. I'm, I'm, I'm I don't know how I got through half of them. You know, one example would be we had a, a, a Japanese Ushideshi that was training in, in uh, Australia. Uh, he was uh, Sensei Ishii, yes, Teoko Room, Sensei Ishii. And I'm lucky too because when he came over from Japan, uh, to, to base himself in Australia. It was around about 1985. So I'm very lucky through 1986, in the 1985 and through 1986, um, the beginning of, beginning of 1987, he had his own classes in the Hombu at the Hombu Dojo in the AKK yeah. in Bondi. And also I trained under him twice a week as well. So I got to you know, you know, see what Ushideshi style mm. of training was. And uh, it was just absolutely gut-wrenching. And he, he was there one <laughs> night, and she and Jimmy was taking class. And I tell this story to my students and, and half awesome. of them just won't believe me. But I always say to them too, I have no reason to exaggerate and I have no reason to lie to you. Awesome. Tell you a story, it's the story. Can't wait. Anyway, she and Jimmy's out the front there and we get to the kicking part of our kihon. And she and Jimmy, there's probably about 40 people in the class. And she and Jimmy points to the first 10 students who are lined up in class. And goes, 10 count, 10 count, 10 count, 10 count, 10 count, 10 count, all the way through to 100. Us. You, you know what I mean? So um, long story short, it ended up being 1,000 Mai Kiage, 1,000 Hizagiri, 1,000 Kingeris, 1,000 Yoko Kiage, 1,000 Kansetsu, 1,000 Yoko, 1,000 Shiro, 1,000 Uchi Mosh, 1,000 Sotomosh, 1,000 Jodomoshi Yeri. Never forget that number. 
never forget it. It took a couple of hours for us to go through all of that, but it was... <laughs> when they get tired after 50, 60 kicks, and I said, really? Yeah. I was young, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thousands and thousands in one sitting in one class, nonstop. Wow. It's just like, yeah, yeah. Well, so when you're trained in that environment um, with so many hardcore yep. instructors, because no matter the time, Bondi Junction and Kilkshin hadn't fractured, um, Kilkshin hasn't fractured at all around the world. So Bondi Junction was, was pretty much the Hombu Dojo in Australia. And if all different black belts and instructors, visiting instructors wanted to come in and, and, and be able to make a comparison with regards to the standard of their techniques or whether their cutter is correct and whether they could have been, they came to Bondi. Or when, when instructors came from overseas, Bondi was the first dojo that they came and took classes at. So for me, year after year after year, we wow. instructors from Japan, instructors from Africa, instructors, just instructors from all over the place. And I was really, really lucky to be caught in all of that sort of, all of that sort of whirlwind that was sort of going on at times in the 80s. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's how I started my tournament. And then it was in 1990, 1990 I was actually at a dojo one night and this, this guy comes up the steps and he asked, he, come, he came in and asked if he could train with us that night because he was just passing through. He's on his way back to Coffs Harbour and he was passing through. He said, yeah, no worries. And so he, he knew sort of what Kyokushin was. I mean, he sort of, he, he sort of came in, had a bit of a, 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 a class with us. And, and then he went, anyway, when he left, I didn't think anything of it. And then two weeks later, I got a phone call from, actually from him. And I found that he was actually a promoter, kickboxing Muay Thai promoter in Coffs Harbour. Okay. And he had a fight on he had a fight on in two weeks and he was asked if I was interested in competing. And I thought, oh well. I did a b- bit of boxing when I was when I was a little bit younger. Yes. Um, um not not a specific traditional boxing at a at a club or a police boys club, but boxing with regards to my uncle Shane bits and pieces, you know, yes. being able to hook and weave and doing that sort of stuff. So I said, Oh, okay, I was Probably more curious than anything else, you know. Mm-hmm. Because he said he had to get in the ring and fight one person in front of this crowd and win this big trophy and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And I thought, again, be, being a young guy, I thought <laughs> I might give it a go. And I had the chance too to put a couple of my fighters in there as well. Um, so anyway, we trained for a couple of weeks and we went over there and we did really, really, really well. And we were bitten by the bug with regards to adding more fights on our calendar with regards to. Preparing gotcha. ourselves for our own nationals. So, because, you know, we, you know our, for most of the organisations, they compete in the state tournament and they compete in the national tournament. And, and they, may, they may compete in, in one or two, if they're lucky, possible outreach tournaments that may go on, like, yes. yeah, Super Four or, or Xi'an Judd Reed's Eight Man. That's or, it. You know, the River Inn Championships in Grafton and that sort of stuff, in, uh, in Griffith, Griffith and that sort of stuff. So I said to the guys, I said, listen, uh, if, if we if we compete in this kickboxing in Muay Thai, it'll give us the chance to, to train all year round and it'll give us the sort of train to sort of keep our level or standard quite high because we're always competing. And yes. that was John Horford and Michael Mazzi. And the amount of championships that those guys won is just incredible. Three world titles, South Pacific, multiple titles, you know, 20 Australian kickboxing titles from WKA to the ISK to WKB. You know, the, the, the list goes on. Yeah. And uh, these guys were very, very talented. And I think I got them at a good age when they were in their, in their late teens. So anyway, uh, as the years rolled on, we consistently competed on the kickboxing circuit around Australia where we were probably competing maybe on average, maybe each, maybe between probably six and eight opponents throughout the course of the year, maybe sometimes more. My, my biggest one, I think, was 14 fights in one year, excluding mm. my Kyokushin knocked out. Yeah. Okay. Because I made sure, that no, matter, no matter what, I, I made sure that um, Kyokushin print was my principal concern. And the kickboxing in Muay Thai was is just only in addition to. Yep. And I think that's contributed really, really well to my tournament success because I had the chance to train and compete against so many different people, et cetera, that when the Kyokushin style of fighting came, um, I was three quarters of the way there in terms of my preparation. Oh, yes. wow. Whew. There you go. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> that is awesome. What a, what a, what a, um, what a chapter there. I, I guess I could uh, uh, yeah. make a statement mm. on that. What a chapter for you there. And I get the chance to meet, 
all of the greats in kickboxing as well in terms of, you know, particularly a lot of the Victorians that you, you would sort of sort of know in the past from, from Stan the Man to Gurdukhan Oz Khan and Tosca Petridis. And, and really, I could just roll the list out and you yes. know every single person I'm talking about. So because we competed so often in Queensland and Victoria and Perth and in New South Wales, we got the chance to fight in a lot of the fight cards from, from Tarek Zolak and, and yes. Johnny. Uh, uh, anyway, all the top promoters. All those guys, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and, it, and it, was, it was pumping. And it, it actually got brought up not long ago in the conversation how good, um, you know, the Asia-Pacific or Australasia uh, kickboxing yeah. slash full, you know, strikers uh, we have. And, and, and we, we've got some amazing pedigree. And um, yeah. Yeah. thanks to lads, uh, yeah, you know. Very, very talented. Very talented, yeah. So, Xi'an, that's amazing. Can you, can you guide us into um, one of the most special um, achievements that you've had is representing Australia in the 1991 Fifth World Tournament? Mm-hmm. Can you give us some of uh, some take on that and some some history there towards you know um, in sharing that? That'd be great. If I take you back to 1980, 1984, I think it was 1984, 1983, and we were trading in the in the Junction Dojo, and then there was a period after the class where a phone call came in, and it was somebody from Japan ringing Australia to let Australia know how our fighters were going in the, in the third Us. world tournament. And I could just sort of tell, I was only, I only just joined Kyokushin at that time, but I could tell by the excitement and the way that they were speaking uh, about the Australian team competing in this full contact tournament in Japan overseas. I could tell that this was really, really heavy duty stuff. Just yes. the manner in which they were speaking. So, so I, I learned, you know, right back then, that competing in this world tournament in Japan was such a special thing and, mm-hmm. and the opportunity we be giving to that many people and yet to sort of really earn your spot to have you at Japan. <coughs> so it was 1990, uh, no, sorry, it was, it was 19, yes, it was 1990 and I had the chance to uh, fight uh, Marcus Mad Dog Magnin, Mangan, I don't know if you know that name, Marcus Mangan. Yes, I do. Mangan. Yes, I do. Yeah. He fought in Victoria quite a few times and stuff. And I think he might have even fought Amir when, when Amir was competing. Um, so anyway, I, I, I asked Hanchi if he, if he was interested in seconding me that night in the corner. So Hanchi said, oh, no problem. So Hanchi sort of came, we met Hanchi there and he, and he sort of worked my corner that night. And um, I had this really, really hard, tough fight with Marcus Mangan over five rounds. And, um, and, I, and I lost the fight. Was, was that it? Sorry, no, no, I'm mixing it's it up okay. with another fight. Sorry, sorry. No, no. See any fight with me, Patrick? I'm there you here. go. No. The it was actually on Alex, tu- Alex Tui's world, t- uh, world title fight card when he fought Ash Gill at okay. the Homebush Sports Stadium. There you and go. I was invited by the, yeah, I was invited by the New South Wales Kickboxing Federation to have a five-round fight. Thing. It was Glenn Baragri. Glenn, Glenn Baragri, that's right. And I fought Glenn over five rounds. And it was one of the first fights, I think, that was actually – Film for Fox, so I'm not too sure, but I think it might have been for okay. Fox. And 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 Alex Tui knocked Cash Gill out in, in round nine with a beautiful uppercut for the WKA. I think it was super super middleweight uh, world kickboxing title. So anyway, I lost the fight over five rounds. I wasn't dinged up. I wasn't bashed in any way, shape, or form. My opponent just won on decision, and he was he was more of a, a quite a tall, lanky boxing style of, of kickboxer. So. So he had a lot more experience than me with regards to boxing. Um, so we went backstage and I was in the chamber with Hanchi and Hanchi says, we're, we're offering you a, a chance to um, go across to, uh, to the world tournament in Tokyo at the end of the year and, and compete in the fifth knockdown. Are you interested in that? Yeah, absolutely I was. Yeah. Um, I was ecstatic and thrilled. But again, it took me a while to absorb mm. what, what he was telling me. It was one of those things where you know, you're an athlete. Now your your coach is telling you, you know, you're about to go to the Olympics. It's one mm. of those sort of things. Okay, you're about to, you got the chance to sort of go to Japan and compete. So I was thrilled. I uh, went back home, discussed things with the wife and family and stuff, because I, as you know, preparing for these, for anything with regards to full context and things, your family, your family plays a big part in your in your preparation, awesome. in, your, in your mental well-being, your, your 
uh, state of mind with regards to being able to do the work that needs to be done. So I, I wrote myself a, a, a really strict training routine. Um, normally I fought as a lightweight in the lightweight division. So, so normally I, I come in about 69, 68, 69 kilos for the weight division. And because I don't, my weight doesn't fluctuate too much above that because I'm competing in the other things throughout the course mm. of the year. Very rarely I get above 72. So, you know, usually about 68, 69. But I knew for the World Tournament of Japan, being a no weight tournament, where there actually is no weight division, that, 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 that would just be too light. So I, I grabbed myself a routine, then I went down to um, one of my sponsors, who was one of the weightlifting gyms in Tamworth, and I had a bit of a talk to, to uh, Dennis Rickson, who was the owner of the gym around that time, and I let him know my, my goals and my intentions with regards to bulking up and putting some weight on. So anyway, I don't think I missed a session in, in the gym four or five four or five because I was training full time at that I was training full time around that time throughout the course of the day yes. that was available to me because I was uh, doing my uh, my work was actually working uh, had my own IT business and I did a lot of stuff from home and did a lot of stuff in my office at night so you know late late at night so I had the chance to be able to train full time from when the sun come up and I. Nice. Went out on the road with my road work between six and ten k's, you know, five or six days a week. Wow. Um, in so anyway, uh, I, I trained my guts off for months and months and months. And just before I left for Japan in November, I was about 80, 80 shit, about yeah, probably just over eighty-two kilos. Well done. Really good for someone like me who's a natural lightweight, you know, where it doesn't get above seventy-two kilos. So that was good. Uh, so we flew to Japan and you got to sort of see all the different teams that are sort of getting off the planes and arriving at the airport and getting uh, moved along in, with regards to your country and set in your groups to the buses and getting taken to Tokyo into the to your place where you'll be staying, etc. And Were you staying at the Metropolitan? Uh, Did you stay at the Metropolitan Hotel in Nikibukuro? Um, I think it actually might have been actually, yeah, I think it actually might have been because it was in a and close to Hombu Dojo. We just sort of walked up the road and where it was. Um, but it was really, really interesting because you, you know, there's a, a couple of times there at the airport that you're for the very, very first time. I'm starting to see people that I recognise from some of the magazines and videos that, yes, you know, back in the early eighties. Back in the, sorry, back in the in the eighties, it was one of those only ways to actually see. How Kyokushin fighters moved, etc., was to be able to get your hands on a video. So they were like gold when they came. Yes. So we used to watch, uh, we used to, yeah, we used to watch Lucky because we're through Hanshi Taylor, we get the chance to watch the a lot of the All Japan, see a lot of the other people haven't seen, and mm -hmm. a lot of the, uh, the World Tournaments, etc. Um, so yeah, I sort of I knew I was running with the big dogs, you know, when I sort of went over there. So that was really, really interesting. And, you know, looking around and you think, oh, yes. Shit. Yeah, yeah. Michael Thompson was one of these Kyokushin fighters from the UK who, when I actually saw his footwork in video and saw the way that he, he swayed to and fro and he did his little step in and little That's step out, and I sort of watched that. And I molded a lot of my footwork uh, off Michael Thompson because awesome. I, was, I was watching these things leading up to my black belt. So, all of these things that I sort of see, you know, sort of see Matsui, you know, watch the way he do his Moshi and his Shaw Moshi Gary. Nice. And, uh, watch the way you know uh, Nick DeCosta or Anthony DeCosta were sort of ripping those hard parts. and I'd sort of taken the best yep. of what I saw in the videos, etc., and tried to implement it into my own style, coupled with huge influence from she and Jim Phillips. I mean, obviously, there's a huge influence because he's the instructor I got to look up to and watch and train under nearly every, every single day. So I, I molded a lot of myself on him as well. And a lot of people stay deep to this day when they sort of see me move around. They're like, "Oh yeah, I can." I can see, particularly old school, she, she and Jim Phillips and you. That's you know, cool. I tell that to my students too, they find that really, really weird that, you know, you can sort of pick and choose. You know, you can sort of look at a student sometimes and say, oh, more than likely, I bet you his instructor is so-and-so. There's a real good <laughs> chance that he's yeah. to leave that sort of thing. Yeah. So, yeah, it was really interesting. Um, uh, so then, I think it was the next day, we went to this motel. A uh, big motel hallway for the weigh-in, and all the fighters were lined up all the way down the hallway. Um, there was hundreds, you know, a couple of hundred fighters in there, and, and one by one, all the fighters' names were called, and you either made the short walk if you were down the end of the hallway already, or, or the long walk, you were all mm -hmm. eyeballing you, 
to get into the room where you had the, you did your way in on the scales, etc. So that was really, really cool because um, obviously the Japanese team was there as well. So all the top teams were there. So I'm looking around the room actually and I'm, I'm thinking, oh my God, there's Yamaki. Oh my God, there's Edimir da Costa. There's Nick da Costa. There's Matsui. There's Kenji Midori. There's Andy Hug. There's Francisco Filio. You know what I mean? I'm in oh, this company man. now. I'm in this life and I've read in books and looked at it in videos. And I thought, oh my God. And now I'm so like, wow, you're in the same time. Unreal. As these guys who have inspired you probably more, more than anybody yeah. in regards to overseas. I mean, look, the world tournament tapes were it. You know, what you saw in the world tournament tapes is it gave you a glimpse of the best of the best. That's it. And the best of the best with their, with their um, personalized specific styles, you know? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so that was really, really cool. And then getting, uh, and then on, on the first day of the tournament, the walk on, that was really interesting because you're walking on with the, with the flags and the Australian sign out the front. And, you know, I'm in this group and, you know, this is a, this is, Crazy group, Keith Bosler to Mick Young to Sam Greco. Um, um, oh, it was just fantastic. Shion Billy. Um, Shion Billy was in your team. Shion Billy, yes, yeah, sorry, yes, yeah, Shion Billy. And a lot of officials that sort of turned up as well. Um, but no, it was an eye opener. It was, it was absolutely fantastic um, competing in that tournament at that level. Uh, very fortunate uh, in the first fight. I, I, I fought a guy from, I think it was fought a guy from, I think it was Fiji. Um, and I'm really, really lucky because I scored the first Ipon on that first day, and it was the it was the fastest and the very, very first Ipon of the whole world tournament on day one. And so I'm really, really pleased that I scored the first full full knockout. There was other awesome. knockdowns, but that was a full, full clean, unconscious for, for quite a while. And I know I was really, really thrilled. Um, and then I came back on the second day, and I got the chance to fight one of the De Silvers from Brazil. Oh, yes. And I took, yeah, I took him to an extension, uh, and then I lost the decision in the in the extension. And it's one of those fights. To this day, I kick myself because I've just you know when you look back, you think you know if I would have really put the foot down, hit the accelerator in that last thirty seconds, I, I might have gone through to the next round. And, and it's even worse for me because in the next round, I would have been fighting the lightest Japanese fighter on the Japanese team. Uh. That's the main thing I missed out on not getting the chance to fight a Japanese in Japan in front of Sosai. Um, yeah. So, so yeah. So, sorry. No, this is how the brain works. This is why I've got yeah, you. Yeah. See? Yeah. In the second round, was actually a fight on Costa Rica. Okay. And he, and he, and he made a big mistake when we were fighting because we're hammering into each other. And as, we, as I'm slamming in, into his chest and stomach, he slams his chest like that and tells okay. me to come on. And I don't know what happened. I've just hit the red button, bam! And then <laughs> seconds later, I think when it went back on the replay and they showed, I, I hacked his legs with about four or five low kicks, just chop, 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 and he put his hands up, and that fight was over. So, so I'm really, really lucky on the on the first and second days. I was Good still, uh, competitor, and then uh, I got the chance to fight, uh, yeah, uh, De Silva from Brazil, a little bit heavier than me, quite a quite a good technique. Mm. But in hindsight, I just thought if I maybe pushed a little bit harder, I would have had a chance of cracking him. But but you'll never know, you know, you never know. It's one of these things. So then I got the chance to sit back then and watch the final sixteen fighters do their thing. And, and uh, since a uh, um, Mick Young was still in the in the final thirty-two, so we still had a chance. And he made the, uh, I think that was his last fight. So you no, know, very very fortunate to sort of see the best of the best and and those that I'd idolised for years actually. 20 feet away, you know, I was literally 30 feet away when Francisco threw that round kick they called Andy. Andy Hug, you know, I was, you know, yeah, I was, I was that close to the side of the mats. So there's a, there's a few moments in that tournament. Was it, was, was it, over, was it, uh, what was your thoughts? Was it on the buzzer, over, over the buzzer or on the gong? What was it? I, I would, I would give the kick to Filio because it was such a fine line between, it was. between um, the, you know, the technique was on, on its way and it was moving yeah. at speed by the time the buzzer went. So you know, people can make that argument sort of, sort of all day, but I'm realized was. I, I've, 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 I've watched that. Um, uh, all this stuff is amazing. Chian, thank you so much for sharing all that. That's just giving me goosebumps because I have gone through watching that as well. And when you were just gesturing, uh, the fighters on who you watched. I was a massive fan of just just a lad called Kazumi. 
Hajime Kazumi, I, I loved everything about that. Uh, I loved his, his, his stance, his posture, his control, yeah. his um, demeanor. Yeah. He's, he's, he's just, you know, ice. Yeah. And um, he never won a world tournament. But um, I saw the, um, in segue, I saw the uh, filio. Um, yeah. he, he, he had changed, well, he was, he was a young up and coming fighter. And the hook had come second in 87. Um, uh, 87, yeah, I think so, with Matsui. And um, it was at that term where Filio was just, he was very, very good. He was very good. And he, he, couldn't, he couldn't get in as much that fight. And yeah. uh, it was one for the ages. He had a period that he went through. And, and as a lot of these fighters do at the high level, you know, they all have their, 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 their short moment, you know, whether it's, a, whether it's a couple of years or it's a, you know, whether it's a half a dozen years, it's one of those things where, you know, where, Everyone has their small moment where they shine if they're lucky with regards mm. to uh, the standards or their achievements in full contact. And obviously, of course, it's, it's very difficult to hold because you know, we all get older and, and what motivates, starts to motivate and drive us changes as, as, we, as we get older. So it really, really is a young man's sport. Um, but then I'd, I'd say by the same token, if you're, if you're motivated, um, even somebody who, who's in his late 30s is just in his prime. You know, so, yeah, very, very lucky that um, that I had such a long career, you know, which gave me the chance to sort of meet so many people, travel to so many different places and, and compete at so many different levels. So I'm, I'm very, very lucky. But but the world fifth world tournament is really, really special because it was the last world tournament where Sosai was here. Yes. And it was the, the last world tournament um, of the of the older, recognised, old school fighters. Oh, you know, you know what I mean. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, whether it's from South America, from the UK, whether it's from Japan, whether it's from uh, throughout Europe, and then we have a whole new generation of different fighters that come through as each world tournament sort of comes along, and we're, and we're lucky because we've watched this, the style of Kyokushin really evolve, particularly over the probably particularly over the last last uh, 10, 10, 15 possible possible years, where the the, the variations that we're starting to see come through. In the, in the fighting style is becoming uh, 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 more effective. Um, you know, like for example, when 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 Andy Hug first introduced his style of the switch axe kick from the sort of more shooting more axe kick, he was very very foreign until Andy started applying it in full contact tournament and applying it in such a way where he could show that it could work under pressure. And then as you watch Kyokushin evolve over the years, you sort of see slight variation of this here, variation of that here, mm. of that there. And, and I think it's only, only good for the style because it's, um, it's just proving that, that our fighters, even though we're sort of still working our same basics, et cetera, we're just getting better and better as each generation comes through. How are you um, uh, progressing or coaching slash growing the, the in, in, in respect of the kumite and the fighting side of Kyokushin, how important is it? Uh, can you share with us from your angle how important it is to continue ha keeping that alive? And, and uh, you know, or, or, or what, what are you saying in that angle in, in 2020? Yeah. Let's talk 2020 next year onwards. Well, most importantly for myself, I think it's really important that we keep the old school traditions alive in the dojo, first and foremost. Yes. Um, even sometimes even more so than the, the standard of training. So when a student knows they come into a Kyokushin dojo, they face the front wall, they, they let everybody know that they're there with an ice loud horse, mm -hmm. they walk in the floor, they wear shoes, they, they have correct etiquette in the dojo and, and all the different rituals that we have. I think this is this is probably the most important thing I've done with regards to when I left my junction. I just moved all those traditions that I saw and I knew and I learned straight to my own dojo. And even on many, many different levels too, have have really pushed them hard to make sure that the standard is always adhered to from the students. Um, it's one of those things, since I we we that a lot of people who train for a long time can appreciate, particularly as instructors, where familiarity breeds contempt. <laughs> and I you know, recognise that if you don't evolve with the times, then you don't also. Uh, teach your students in such a way where they sort of recognize there is student, student, and then there is teacher. Us. And, and you don't familiarize yourself too much with your students. Then they tend to, I think, to tend to respect you a lot more. Um, 
you know, it's one of those, it's one of those things where your teacher is not your buddy mate pal. They're a good friend. They, they, yeah. they, they, they enjoy your company and they um, nice. are very, very pleased and blessed for you to be a part of their life. But for uh, your students to really, really take you set, teach, you know, take you seriously, and uh, you've got, always got to remember that um, your place as teacher, as mentor, etc. Um, and, and you've got to keep yourself uh, slightly above your students with regards to Understood. what you expect of your children. Um, so I think these are important things to keep the tradition alive in the Kilkshin system. Um, like anything, you watch over time that things slowly, slowly get diluted here or there, or, or the instructor gives away here or gives away there. And I think that's the thin edge of the wedge. And with it comes to, with regards to the Kubate, Kubate is, is so important in the Kilkshin system, as you well know. It's it's a, a major part of what we do. It's not it's not a you know, it's not when, you, when you're when you're a Kyokushin fighter and you're actually fighting and you haven't reached your prime yet and you're competing in your tournaments, you, you think this is going to sort of go on forever and you don't necessarily recognize that this full contact fighting one day is going to come to an end and then there has to be another drive and there has to be another motivation that keeps yeah. you training. Yeah. And obviously, I discovered that, obviously, did with regards to my own Kihon and my own Kata, etc. Um, but it was in 2014 and I. I had the chance to do the 50 man Kubate. Nice segue. Here we go. <laughs> if I'd like to do it. And I was thought this was, this was, this was the beginning. This was, oh, probably about two thirds into 2014, about, about August, September, about 2013. That's actually first time I see in my mind. I've been doing the 50 man Kubate. And obviously I thought about that. But because I had my own students and family and work, and it was one of those, one of those things there where I, I thought about it a few times through my mind, but never really thought seriously about what I consider it. Can I cut you off and ask how, how old you were at that time? Just to share with people to understand as well how old you were with respect. To- I was actually 49. Boom. <sighs> sorry, this was, sorry, this was um, September of 2013. Okay. 2013. Hey, man. <laughs> when, I, when I was 49. Henry. And I'd also had the opportunity in 2014, Hanshi said also, um, had my chance to go to South Africa and do my Gorda, do my fifth down over there. Okay. You know, we were over there for the World Cup anyway, and all the, all the high ranking instructors were over there anyway. So, yep. actually, Matushima holds his senior ratings when he's, when he's in these different countries for the World Cup. So I thought to myself, well, if I want to do the 50-man kumite, A, I've got to do it before I become a shihan, and B, I want to do it before I turn 50. So I thought, and this is all through September, all through October and part of November, and, and now we're starting to get close. So now we're like we're four months out, you know, and even though I was, I was still reasonably fit because I was, I was taking probably five classes a week around that time anyway, so I, I didn't. I didn't have all the black dots that I have now to sort of take my classes when I'm not there. So I thought about it long and hard. Mm. But then you get, the, you get the demon on your shoulder, don't you? And the demon <laughs> start like, Ooh, are you sure you can do this? And, you know, push comes to shove and you're getting smacked around the floor. You're getting smacked around the floor in front of your instructor. You're getting smacked around the floor in front of your fellow black belt instructors. Yeah. And you're getting smacked around the floor in front of all the other students who look up to you in that room because they held up the senior camp in Sydney. And worst comes, worst, worst comes to worst, you get smacked up in front of your wife or your partner or your daughters and your kids will turn up and sort of watch. So they they were uh, uh, yeah that was probably the hardest for me to sort of face with regards to things. I wasn't I wasn't fearing the exhaustion, I wasn't fearing the pain, I wasn't fearing the good difficulty. But what scared me was um, myself being found. I'm in a position now where I have no control and I'm getting beaten up by everybody. Okay. And that was a, used to give me nightmares. It used to give me nightmares. Was so you... throughout October and November, I really thought about that. And I just thought, well, okay, my, if I'm going to do the necessary preparation that I need to do, because I hadn't done it yet, I was just keep maintaining my fitness. Um, I'd have to um, do it by beginning of December. 
so anyway, leading up to the end of November, and I'm 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 feeling like Superman one moment, and I'm feeling like a six-year-old boy who's <laughs> scared because I've just gotten in trouble about something the next, and it would fluctuate out throughout the course of the day how I felt. So anyway, I did the right thing. I contacted Hanshi Taylor, Hanshi Taylor, and I let him know my fears. I let him know what was on my mind. Of course. What my, my motivation was for doing the 50 man, if I did do it, and what my fears were. And Hanshi said the best thing he could have ever said for me. He just reminded me who I was and the achievements thus far that I'd, won. Won, I'd achieved for them and the standard of my technique, et cetera, and timing mm. and blah, blah, blah. And that's all I needed since I yeah. and I hung up that phone conversation. I was good to go. I was just no problem. I didn't, not for a, not for a second from that moment, really, till the completion of the 50 man, did I doubt myself. And I'm, I'm lucky because it was one of those things that you, where a lot of your students sort of don't, you don't recognize it at a time for yourself that you hang off your instructor's opinion all the time. Mm -hmm. It's really important to the student with regards to the instructor's opinion. And when I got that from Hanshi Taylor, it was like gone. The switch was just hit and I was right. How was so, it measured, uh, Shion? How was it, was it measured on a win-loss win ratio or was it just get through the 50? Just get through the 50. Cool. Um, there's 25 black belts and you fought everybody twice. You know, it's one of those, it's one of those weird things too, where, you know, if you give them a bit, a bit too much of a touch up in the first 25, they will remember that all the pain <laughs> that like you did in the second 25. You know, and I sort of found that out sort of thing. It was really interesting. So, so my training routine, it upped from, from a few hours a day to probably six hours a day on average. Wow. I was getting up before the sun come up every morning, uh, well, not every morning, about three mornings, and I'd probably jog between six and 10 kilometers before I'd come home and have a shower and have breakfast. Same, same sort of thing though, but this time I was working full time. So I'd have to do all the stuff before there and at lunchtime and you know training in the evening. How long did and you do this for? Up, How long did you do this for? Three months? How, what, what, what? Uh, yeah. Um, the hard stuff was set down for 12 weeks. Okay. So I built, I built as each week went, went on. I awesome. trained seven days a week, seven days a week, probably for the first four to five weeks. Um, and I split it up where, where we, you know, alternate days, one were working on many rounds of Kumite in the dojo, conditioning, push up, sit up, squats, all the stuff, mm -hmm. biometrics, things that, you know, lots of stretching. And then on the other three days or four days a week, it was just totally basic. If you're fighting on good form, good timing, good rhythm, good balance, and strategizing, strategizing the, the manner in which I was going to fight. And it's really, really weird because, you know, as the week's leading in, when I'm doing, you know, I had four one-hour bag works per week where it was like bag work. Once it started, I didn't stop until the 60 minutes was over. And I was doing lots of things like that so I could get used to the rounds. Continually going round after who, round after. Who round. guided you with that? Did you just plan that yourself? Who who was who facilitated slash assisted you? Did you get any intel or knowledge of anyone that had done the hundred prior? You know, because there's 20, 27 men have done the hundred, or at, probably at that yeah. time when you did your fifty. But was there any anything you took took any nuggets from anyone on that angle, or was it just um, you? I really fell back on my own training, and my own experience. Okay. By, by that time. Like I said, by that time, I'd had 146 full contact fights. When you talk about the knockdown, the kickbox, and the Muay Thai, the full contact karate, and the boxing type stuff. So, so um, what was the question? Sorry, I've just gone blank. No, it's just understanding if you, 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 you put all this and you, you set the agenda oh, yourself oh, yeah, at the end. I did. I did. I, I, I understand how my body worked. I understand how I was able to get the best out of myself in regards to that style of training, that style of training, because I, I delved into so many, so many styles of training, tweaking this and sort of tweaking that. But uh, over the years, you start to get a really, really good handle on what works nice. and what works specifically for me. Um, but I made sure that I, you know that I you know, three days a week I was working on the the, the kettlebells and the and the, the weights, so I was still doing a little weightlifting three days a week, so I was still working on the power stuff. Um, but literally, I was literally training seven days a week, and it got to the extent where um, I was tired all day, every yes. day, so I realized yes. after about six or seven weeks, I, was, Man, I, got a, I need a day or two off. 
So I took a, I took a couple of days off, re rejuvenated the energy. But again, it was those days, all of these days leading up where I was so in fear of not doing well. Mm. In those days when I didn't want to, when I was overturned and overtired. But then I also understood, well, listen, you're training so much and you're burning thousands and thousands and thousands of calories every single day. And you're not putting an ounce of weight on, sort of mm -hmm. thing, um, that you've got to sort of every now and then look after your body and stuff. So every now and then I had a day or two off here and there. That's and I found it was a big part of it since I was the eating, the diet. Mm. I'd literally go to eating my normal three days, three meals a day with a couple of pieces of fruit to probably eating eight, eight meals a day. Mm. And most of those meals that I was eating wasn't just a snack meal. They were actually big meals. And literally an hour or two after eating that big meal, I was starving again. So towards the end of the 10th and 11th week, I'm getting to the stage now, I'm, I'm getting tired of chewing because I'm having to chew some stuff throughout the course of the day. And this is, I didn't put any weight on, and this is just for me to hold my weight, and which was around about 69, 70 kilos. So I didn't, didn't look very above that. And, oh, i tell you what. And then on the other side of things, I found into about week three or week four, I suddenly got insomnia where my mind was racing so much that I'd go to bed at 10 o'clock at night and I'd wake up at one or two in the morning and that was it. I couldn't get to sleep. Wow. And this went on week after week after week after week. So anyway, wrap it up. We, we you know, on the Fridays we'd have, I'd have 15 fights and then, and then the next Friday I'd have 25 fights and mm. the next Friday I'd have 30 fights. I was just doing the rounds with my own students round after round after round just to get used to the yes. continuous cardio high high heart rate uh, moving around with heavy legs without sustaining too much damage on yep. the shins and on the forehead and getting getting whacked or or throwing in substandard technique and injuring myself i was about to days. just say two questions that, that i'd like to ask you on that which is which is cool, cool to understand you obviously didn't get injured or did you carry any injury? And then second, were you practicing with shin pads, gloves leading into um, like, obviously there would have been a term two weeks out, which is, you know, no, no, no comment there, no damage and all that. But what, what was the component of shin pads? And I'm asking because there's probably a whole bunch of people out there going, having just completed their gradings or showdown or knee done gradings coming up. But how did you prepare that side of the, of that? And, and, and then the injury part, you didn't get injured. Um, the only real injury that I got was actually leading up to the 50 man training. It was about, it was about nine weeks out because I was doing a lot of sprints. I was, I was doing everything at Sensei. Of course. And I was doing a lot of sprints and then this one afternoon I, I did a sprint and I, and I either took off too hard and jolted and I, I pulled my right calf muscle. I was shattered. out from this 50 man and just pulled my calf muscle. But leading up to that, um, going back to what you're talking about, no, all the commentary in the dojo was gloves and padded up because it was it was all about working on timing and footwork. Yes. Um, it, it wasn't a time where, unlike when you're helping your students, seeing your students prepare for, for a knockdown tournament, where you're you're really hacking in and going in hard and really yes. pushing them through. It wasn't wasn't that sort of training at all. And I knew by the same token, the last thing I needed to do was injure any of my students because that means they couldn't do the rounds with me. Gotcha. So yeah, it was it was looking after myself right until the day before I left home to go down to the senior camp where the grading was held. Yeah, just shin pads, gloves, um, and that's it, timing, balance, rhythm, coordination, focus, strategizing in my mind. And it's really, really weird because in the weeks leading up and as the weeks ticked over and you're doing your, your pad work or you're doing your bag work and stuff, you're really hammering in. Mm. in your mind, you, my mind, I was going to think I was going to fight this 50 man real offensively. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Real offensive in this fifth man, and it's that was cut short real quick. <laughs> because when, when the first opponent came out and they would come out hard, it was like my mind is like, Whoa, 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 I thought we were gonna ease into this. We're gonna get it back. <laughs> you know, you know, like, bang, 100 miles an hour right from the first fight. So, you know, that was before that. If I can tell you a little quick little story before that, I, I arrived in camp. Um, I was probably for my age, I was superbly fit. My condition was excellent. I had no injuries whatsoever. Um, my mind was calm. My uh, fighting spirit was content. 
Uh, as you know, it's, you know, confidence is drawn from the work that you put in. Correct. You know, when you're, you're full proof at tournament day and you're, you're lifting up around the around the mats, etc., and that confidence just comes from all the work that you put in. It's like, well, well why wouldn't I do well? I've trained every bloody That's night, etc. You know, one of those sort of things. So anyway, I got to camp. And I got to camp about about eight o'clock. And usually in camp, you go to bed about 10 o'clock because you've got a five o'clock wake up for, for the training that goes on over the weekend. And this is on the Friday night and the 50 man is going to be held um, at 70, 7.30 the next night on the Saturday. Okay. So I jump into bed and it's in dormitory set up. And as I'm laying there, it's about 10 o'clock. As I'm laying there, I mean, I'm exhausted. I've hardly slept at all for the last couple of months. And as I'm laying there, all of a sudden, one of the sensors underneath me starts snoring. <laughs> and it's coming loud and clear. And I'm trying to leave and I'm trying to sleep. And I'm like, oh my God. And I laid there for, for what seemed like hours and hours. So I got out of bed, pulled the mattress off, put it in the middle of the hallway between all the doorways for the dormitory and laid down there. Oh, and now, I can hear, now I can hear stereo snoring from the different rooms. <sighs> and now it's, about, now it's about midnight, one o'clock in the morning. And I know we've got to get up at five. So I dragged the mattress outside. I lay it down under the stars, and as I lay my head back on the pillow, because I'm a sound sleeper, in the distance I could hear the trucks gearing yeah. down as they came on the highway into the, yeah. the, the suburban area. So now mm. I'm listening to these trucks, and this went on for hours and hours. Now, <laughs> it is, now it's quarter to it's it's five on the Saturday morning of the fifth man, and I haven't slept for a week, not oh. for one second. We're going to get up in 15 minutes anyway. And, and start our first early morning class, the first class of three that we were going to have on the Saturday. Um, so I might as well get up. And we got up, had a shower, um, dissipated in those classes throughout the course of the day. And then when um, 7.30 came, I, I was in the change room downstairs. And when I came up to the hall, I had two of my professional, or sorry, one professional, one helping out, cameramen who were there to film at nature room. And this 50 man can be found on YouTube, just Mark Tyson 50 man film tech. Awesome, so thank you. Cool. Yep. Put the mats on the floor, the Hanchi Taylor had organized, and then I, I walk into the room and there's 25 black belts all lined up against the wall. And I had Sensei Robert Moretti and uh, Sensei uh, Muhammad Aziz, who were my seconds, who looked after me, and, you know, make sure I had my water there and my wet yes. cloth, etc. Um, and then, then it started. But in that whole 90 minutes of the 50 man quilt, I probably think I only walked off the floor maybe four times, 15, okay. 20 seconds at the most, to, you know, wipe my head down, have a quick drink, and then sort of back on the floor. Um, so now Hanshi was really, really strict on that with regards to you couldn't just wander off to and have a drink after each flight just because you wanted to, sort of thing. Sure. So, you no, know, I got through that. It was, it was tough. Well um, done. The students pushed me along. Um, and then it was all over. It was just a, a absolutely total relief that I hadn't let anybody down. My family oh, down, my mate. students down. You've got me sweating down. here. I'm sweating here, Shian. That's yeah. awesome. That well done. Fantastic. And then she I had to, I wanted to prove a bit of a point too. And I made sure that the five o'clock, the very, very next morning, because this didn't finish till nine o'clock, 9.30 that yeah. night. I made sure five o'clock the very next morning, I was still up the front ready to go with all the other students competing in the camp training day. So, no, fantastic. I was, uh, I was Come, lucky that I was so fit, you know. And that's I, and I didn't awesome. Injuries, you know, the lies that, you know, bruised chest. And, oh, yeah. shit. Really Congratulations. Actually, well done. It was a great experience. For in everyone. Reality, if I was in my 20s, I would, have, I would have given 100 a crack. You know, I just, I just would have if I... If I yeah, you know, 20s or possibly early 30s. Yeah, you're quite mentally tough from your prime in your yeah. 30s. So, yeah, so maybe a little bit time. But to do it at the age that I did it, I, I think is is a, is a good well, thing. well, you've inspired me. You've inspired me, and I know Shyam Billy's yeah. going to be listening to this, and he's he's gestured it to me in the past. I know this is going to yeah. trigger mayhem. Uh, yeah. Shyam Billy. I, I actually was uh, she and Billy's uh, created his first website. Oh yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. He was one of those ones late at night at one o'clock in the morning in my office at home that I put together a nice website for him with regards to ah, the Ah, very good. That's it. Yes, yeah, so I really think I got the got a chance to do that. You know, 
Yeah, yeah. 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 Thank you for sharing all of that. That's been amazing. I've just sat back and just enjoyed. I'm sure everyone that's listening that we's going to be blown away. I just want to reiterate one thing, uh, as that Xi'an just said was, you can see his 50 man kumite. He, uh, Xi'an does have some videography uh, experience and, and, and team uh, colleagues there. And it's an, a fantastic, fantastic. Um, uh, it's on YouTube. I won't, I won't sell it. it. It sells itself. So please jump on, type in Mark, Xi'an, Mark Tyson, 50 man kumite. Uh, well done on that. Xi'an, we've got a couple of minutes left. It's, it's flown. It's been awesome. And uh, I want to, I want to keep going. But Shian, I'll probably, well, I would love to get you back on again. And this is the theme of what I'm doing here. These are amazing yeah. stories, amazing things that you share with your Tamworth Dojo and all the loyal students you've had yeah. over the last 30 years. But us, us lads in where, wherever we're coming from that aren't fortunate to be in the four walls of your yeah. dojo, uh, this is awesome stuff. And this is exactly what yeah. I wanted. I think, yeah, I think what you're doing is really important too, uh, Patrick, because it, it's one of those things that unless the story's told, it's just going to get lost in time. Ooh. And then before you know it, it'll just get forgotten about and no one will ever, actually ever know about. So I think you're doing well with regards to the Kilkshin stuff because it gets things recorded, gets things down. So people now can sort of go back and sort of learn a bit of the history about different people and how they, how they were able to come to the positions they are. So, no, no, fantastic. I'm really pleased you're doing that. I appreciate that. Xi'an, I always end uh, my chats with a little bit of a, a bite. And, and the bite is, the, I mean, this amazing passion that you have for the arts and martial arts. And um, I, I just wanted you to add, add, some, add some, um, something to it here and just summarising and, and ending it on it. How do you continue doing what you're doing? What is it that drives you? There's a lot of people out there that need some motivation or inspiration, but for someone like yourself, what, what is it that triggers you and continues to make you succeed in this, in, in the arts? I think very, very fortunate sense though that I've, that, that I've never fell out of love with Kyokushin. Okay. From the moment I stepped into Kyokushin Dojo in September of 1983 and entered the world of Kyokushinkai, uh, and very, very fortunate to be in a dojo with so many talented, motivated, skilled, highly disciplined students, and particularly a lot of instructors that were there at the time. Um, it, it instilled the love of Kyokushin into me that I have to this very, very day. Mm. Um, I'm fortunate um, to be in this time of my life where I still love Don and Doggy when I put it on there and walking onto the dojo floor and all the students lining up. That's never changed. Um, what, when people sort of ask me about how I'm able to, to, to do what I do for so long and with regards to what they want to do, and I just say simply, find out what you love and then build your life around what you love. If you can build your life around what you love, you'll be able to do that forever. And the good thing about our traditional kyokushin and martial arts sort of training, whether I'm six or whether I'm 76, um, we can still walk on the floor and still participate and still train along. And there's not a lot of, lot, of, lot of art forms that sort of do that, um, you know, particularly going from full contact karate for myself. And now that I'm in a time in my life where the motivation and drive for me is not just producing high standard students yourself, but it's also, you know, because your learning never ends. Mm. And um, obviously my, my sixth arm will be more for my next grading. Um, so, you know, for myself, it's about working on good standard of Kihon, understanding the Katha and the Bunkai, um, being able to demonstrate and explain things in a manner which your students can understand and they can yes. pass on to others. But I think the main motivation is very, very lucky with regards to my wife, because she's been my main drive yes. from the day that I came to training. And I wouldn't have achieved a tenth of what I achieved if I hadn't met her. Yes. So all the guys out there, if you, if you're sort of not married yet, you've got your girlfriend, etc. I oh. just sort of like to remind you that 85% of your happiness is going to come from that one single decision that you make. So make you think hard and, and make it well. True that. Other than that said, um, I've enjoyed my training. I still do to this day. And, and my hope is that as the years roll on, I'll continue learning like I am. Unreal. Each and every day. Great summary. Great, great end there, Shian. Thank you so much. Uh, to everyone... 
Much appreciated. No, so everyone in Tamworth, you're very, very lucky. Uh, blessed, uh, just like I was talking with Shian Lance, uh, the people in Bendigo and Victoria, very, very blessed. Have a seventh, Dan, mm. and then there's someone like yourself in Tamworth. That's just unreal. And congratulations on everything that you've achieved thus far. And um, thank you so much for sharing and, and being so passionate about your, your, your journey so far and so much more to go. So Shian, Mark Tyson, thank you so much. Big us from us. Us. It's been a pleasure, Sensei. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you.